Hi, everyone, and welcome to this broadcast. Mark DeJesus here, bringing insights for your healing and freedom journey. I'm all about mental, emotional, and relationship health. Welcome to this broadcast. Today, what I want to do is talk about, are you obsessive compulsive about serving? Has the church become obsessed, obsessive about serving? Might be an interesting episode for you and some things to think about for your healing and freedom journey. I'm the author of the book, The OCD Healing Journey, coming out of my own journey of healing, freedom, and transformation. And I'm just passionate to help others in their mental health journey as well. And one of the aspects that many of us are learning about is how we are obsessive and compulsive over certain subjects in our life. And I've been doing a series of broadcasts on different areas that OCD can offer often get into that I see in questions and what people bring and even what I've been through. And today I'm going to navigate a couple things about chronic church serving. And then I'm going to get into a question that's a very intense, obsessive, compulsive example of where it can go. But I think all of us could benefit from what I'm going to share with today because Serving is a beautiful thing. Having a servant's heart, being uh, living in a lifestyle where we are cultivating compassion, living out of compassion, and learning to practice loving each other in dynamic and powerful ways, right? Because love manifests itself in how we relate to each other. So I am all about serving effectively, but I believe that serving has gotten distorted. I believe it's come under major distortion, major dysfunction. It has, in many cases, gotten out of hand. And I find myself ministering to people, helping people who are burned out, whose mental health marriages, family is crumbling. And one of the things that is interfering is their chronic doing, busy serving in their life and in their journey. I got a bit of some congestion today, so you'll have to excuse me for that. If my voice squeaks a little bit or if I get a little uh, stuffy, it helps with my radio voice a little bit. (laughs) So when we look at the subject of serving, what I want to bring out is compulsive patterns of serving, where we are serving out of feeling bad. We are serving in such a way that if we didn't, we would feel massive guilt, where we are serving to the detriment of the issues of our life, where we are serving, hear me out here, where we are serving and not truly connecting. We are just in a constant cycle of busyness. And I believe what's happening is the beauty of lovingly serving one another can get stolen and robbed in this busy cyclone that so many are lost in that I found myself lost in. If you're familiar with my materials, you know that I wrote a book called Exposing the Rejection Mindset. And in it, I talk about the performance-driven mentality, where we live in a performance-driven form of Christianity. And our identity is all out of doing and going and serving, but it becomes not so much the beauty of serving. We become conditioned to live in a form of spiritual slavery, where our identities get formed out of what we do in very unhealthy ways. And many people that are crashing and burning or finding themselves in a crisis of things they're struggling with, they often realize they lived a performance-driven life and detoxing it becomes very, very challenging. I lived and breathed an absolute performance-driven machine. And it wasn't until my own personal crash, meaning the Uh, increase of obsessive compulsive struggles, anxiety, panic attacks, bouts of depression, that I began to realize something needs to shift and needs to change. And for many other people, they find themselves in the same place. And when I see that happening, they're going, oh no, I actually get a little bit excited for them. (laughs) Mark, why are you getting a little bit excited? Because now you can actually address some of the issues of your life that have been neglected some of the areas that haven't been tended to. So what I'm going to share with you here today is going to be some honest assessments of why we often live in obsessive compulsive serving and why the church manifests an obsessive and obsessive tendency when it comes to the subject of, of serving. Again, you want to get a copy of my book, The OCD Healing Journey. It will help you dive in and getting to the heart and getting to 
uh, what drives our obsessive and compulsive struggles. But here's what I want to share with you up front. We have today, we are serving a machine. And the machine is getting an organization to grow in numbers, big and large. Be aware of this machine that begins to take its tentacles and wrap itself around. Because once we begin to serve the machine, we have to keep feeding the machine. It takes over. And while it's understandable, we want to grow, we want to be effective, we become slaves now to the machine that takes over. When numerical and financial growth explodes, we begin to serve it. And so now we flow at a speed, an intensity, and a rate, a rhythm that no longer has the ability to make choices, to take breaks, to slow down. You can't because the machine takes over. And when you live in a performance-driven culture, we serve the platform, we serve the presentation, we serve the growth machine. So pausing, stopping, breaking, rarely ever happens in effective ways because when the machine takes over, the machine is in charge. And we live in a culture today, everything's got to be big, everything's got to be huge, so we lose the beauty of the small, because the small is where the beauty of dynamic life transformation happens, and the small, if done well, is actually slower. It's got space, it's messy, it's not that easy. There's bumps, there's stuff, there's relationship things you have to work out. But when you slow, when you live in the slow, you have more ability to make decisions, to say no. When you live in the slow, you can evaluate more. Today's killer of people's hearts is constant activities, busyness, and I include in that chronic, continual, unending serving. To the neglect of deeper relationships, to the neglect of our own hearts, churches, have taken service and turned it into a pressure-filled, guilt-ridden subject that can often, not always, but can often become manipulative. Because we have to serve the machine, and every pastor who serves this machine, everyone, there's no exemption from this, every pastor who serves the performance-driven machine is frustrated they don't have enough people helping. Because the rate of what's happening is in charge. And they're always mentioning, hey, if we had more people to help, we need more people to serve. So in that crisis, I'm, I'm giving you the honest answers. Without shame and condemnation, I'm just giving you the honest perspective of what happens. In that dilemma, we have to use manipulative, guilt-ridden tactics. I used them. I said them. You have to say certain things to get people motivated. So you often have to guilt them into motivating in, in, into motivating them. And then you have to keep motivating them. You have to keep having, come on guys, yeah, yeah, here you go, good job, good serving, good serving. And so in becoming slaves to the machine, we don't have the ability to step back and say, hmm, should we even be doing this? Should we even be having this ministry? We just assume we should, because most churches do, so we should, we have to. Really, is that what God said? But we don't have space to even ponder is God even leading us to do this? There's no room for that. The assumption is yes to everything. So we just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Now, I'm going to get into some deeper parts of the weeds. These are honest places that we need to understand. And this feeds obsessive compulsive serving. So the big one is serving the machine. Uh, big, large, and what is seen, because we also have a presentation, right, where we have to, uh, you know, bring a certain, this is the image, it's like we have a PR campaign that we have to keep going, right? Even though there's deep struggles and things battling going on, we serve the PR campaign of what's presented there. And then until one day, and there's a fallout, there's an adulterous affair, there's an addiction, there's this, there's um, uh, abuse being uh, revealed. And, 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 and we step back, and what we don't do, the church doesn't do, is we don't go, hey, the way that we're doing things is unhealthy. We go, oh, that pastor needs to resign, that person, terrible person, this and that. We don't take a step back and look, what, what kind of culture are we living in? What are we cultivating? What are we serving? 
It's easy to just kind of point at someone and well, move on. And then we keep going, still continuing in the same kind of mindset. I want to tell you too, the number two, and this is something I, when I, when I soberly realized this, it hit me, it hit me, but in a way of empowerment, which actually led me to go a whole different course in my life and in my journey is that many in the church primarily, mainly relate to each other through serving together. Now, is there great camaraderie, great interaction you can have with people while serving? Of course, yes. But that becomes the primary way that many believers relate to one another. And there's often this narrative that goes on that says, hey, if you're not serving, you're not really getting connected. That's a, a word that's often used. So therefore, you are disconnected. And what does that mean? I'm disconnected from you, and for some it leads to, then it means I'm disconnected from God. This can play some mind tricks, because are we really connecting in serving, or is serving an on-ramp that potentially could go somewhere in deeper, but is that really happening? But here's what I find. Without the serving time, is the relationship still continuing to grow? It's like we have to serve, and if not, and many people find if they take a break or they make some margin, they find they no longer have the value they once had. And we don't want to look at people as commodities within the machine of what they can do and what they can help because churches can become obsessed with creating a bubble of how can we get people on board with our mission and serve this and make it happen and not looking at people and seeing their blueprint because many people in your church actually will not add direct value to your church mission. They may do something that adds value somewhere else, but we subconsciously go, well, they're doing something else. They're not about what I'm doing. You know, there's, there's all these things that go on. And many say, well, once I'm not serving, I no longer have connection. So it, it leads us to asking some questions that we need to start um addressing. And here's a mindset that we need to be honest about. Many churches believe that getting people into serving will eventually lead to discipleship. I'm not saying it never happens, but I'm just saying that just getting someone into serving actually doesn't. I've seen a large percentage of people that would actually be very involved all the time. You never knew anything about their life. You never knew anything about what was going on. It was the busy buzz kept true, deeper intimacy from happening. I reflect back on many of my years in pastoral work, and I'm like, wow, I saw that person over and over and over again. I know nothing about them. I know nothing about them. And I didn't even think about slowing down myself and just getting to know that person's story. Now, I had moments with that. I remember backstage at one of the uh, church performances we were doing, we were doing a big play presentation, and I was backstage with the cast, and we had a break in the action, and a guy began to tell a story, uh, a testimony that he shared with me about uh, his mother's prayer life and, and his rebellion and, 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 and how God worked in his life. And I was like, thank goodness I had this, I had a moment to stop. It was in the moment of the stop, but it never went further. Like the story blessed me, but I was like, oh, it would have been wonderful to break bread together, to, to go further. Oh, there was, a, there was a beautiful invitation there. But hey, oh, oh wait, we got to keep going. And understood that when you're doing a play production, doing things right, the, 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 but the machine takes over. And so I found that we're living a myth. So we just, we, we, I, I've been in church cultures where the, every, every solution they would provide to, to everything. But oh, we'll just get serving, get involved, get involved. Now, wait a second. Um, I've got these struggles, marriage. Uh, every family in the, in the church, every family in the church has battles and struggles they're going through. And the antidote we give, just get into serving. God, it'll, it'll, it'll work out. It'll work out. And then we step back and go, are marriages improving? Is mental health improving? Is emotional well-being improving? Our metrics are numbers and money. Is that really what the metric should be? Or should we step back and say, is there depth? Are, do, we, do, do pastors look around their staff and go, are we really actually connected? I remember saying once at a staff meeting, I don't feel like we even know each other. 
I feel like we do a lot of stuff. And there was just this frustration in my heart because I felt this longing for being healthier. And I was tired of serving the machine because I had a lot of achievement to show people, but not a whole lot of intimate relationship. And that actually fed many of my performance, perfectionism, obsessive compulsive pathways because I'd serve the image of what I needed to keep producing and avoiding relational intimacy and vulnerability. See, because all obsessive compulsives, perfectionists, performance-driven people have to learn what it's like to be in vulnerable, intimate relationship. It, it scares them. It scared me. Like if you kind of asked me how I was doing and you had that look like, hey, how are you doing? I'd get nervous. I'm like, what do they say? You know, you ever get around some of those people? And you're like, what are they looking? Shame rises up because I lived a performance-driven life based out of shame because shame tells me i'm not going to be loved in, in in who i am and where i am so i've got to live in this role keep that role going and do it well because that's where i'll be loved and i equated love with the dopamine rush of applause or good job or great and again the crash and burn helped me to realize i need a change of identity because in a performance-driven, obsessive-compulsive serving kind of mindset, our identities become formed out of service. So who we are is what we do. And don't lie to me. I know who I am. I know who I am. You say it. You preach it. You declare it. But at the end of the day, who you are gets formed in the things that you do. And without what you do, this is why people have midlife crisis, late life crisis, or just identity crisis in general, because maybe they lose a job or they have to change or something forces them to have a break from their role and they start collapsing because their role was built. The whole structure was being held up by their constant doing and service. Takes them away from that serving role and they have no idea what to do with themselves. When I left a, a, a staff uh, pastor position, I went through a major season of withdrawals, of that guilt rising up, that emptiness rising up. And I didn't realize this is actually something that was there all along. I just never saw it because my chronic doing kept me from connecting with it. And so many of us need an identity overhaul. Because who we are is love sons and daughters, but we recognize that we live in a spiritual slavery. Again, if you want to go further in that, get your copy of Exposing the Rejection Mindset, because that will help a lot. But the problem with the obsessive serving world is constant serving keeps things shallow, but also manageable, right? Because if we go deeper, it's no longer manageable. We, no one has time. And we live in a world that's like that. You go to the doctor, the doctor doesn't have time to sit with you and, and go, hey, how's your lifestyle? How's your emotions? How's your eating habits? It's like boom, 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 in and out. It, it's reflected in almost every area of our, no one has time for this. No one has time to sit down and process and share and work through with, with, uh, without there being constant, constant um, movement and keep this, keep this moving. So we become... Uh, traffic control directors on the conveyor belt of the Christian life. Okay, here you go, your service over here. here okay, that's great, that's great. Uh, I, I'm so, sorry, you, you, maybe you should go see a counselor for that. Okay, over here. Oh, really? Okay, well, let's pray for you real quick. This person's going to pray for you. Okay, let's keep it moving, keep moving, keep moving. And what are we not doing? We're not actually connecting. We're getting a hypnotic deception that we are connecting because we're in proximity to a bunch of people. We're around a bunch of bodies, so therefore we feel like we're connecting and we actually don't really know each other. This was a major place. I remember my eyes just opening. Oh my, I worked with hundreds and hundreds over the years of my life, I would even say thousands of volunteers. And I realized so many of the people who served under my work, I didn't really know them. I mean, I knew their name. I knew that they were married or not married and the basic stats. I remember looking back going, hmm, I think so-and-so was struggling with depression. I didn't, even, I didn't even see it. Now looking back, 
oh, I think so-and-so might have had some addiction issues going on. You know what? So-and-so, they really needed some time and attention, and I didn't, I didn't give that. Because, see, I would go from the sound booth, and, and I would just, like a, like a racehorse, run to the front of the stage or go around the back of stage, whatever it is, always in a hurry, always busy. And I'd have this like busy energy. I, and, and if people came by to say hello, I was almost irritated that they were stopping me. Don't you know I have something to do? I had a bit of the Martha issue of getting irritated because I was distracted by the work and not realizing that what was of value was passing me by, was actually... And part of my healing journey caused me to slow down in where I walk and making room and space and time. We don't have time to do that. But it keeps it manageable, right? The show must go on. Keep this going. Keep it happening. Because we're serving this, the mission. The mission becomes a machine that becomes a boss that just drives everything. So if you've got problems going on, anybody got time for this? You got problems in your marriage, suck it up and keep going. You got problems in your mental health, suck it up and keep going. Now, I'm not saying we stop everything and we sit. And, uh, you know, the answer to this is not an, an opposite ditch. But this is just an honest realization. But in this chronic serving, obsessive serving mindset, it allows us to live in the buzz of busyness. You know what I'm talking about when I say a buzz? It's just like a busy noise that's going on. Lots happening. And really, our buzz of busyness matches our level of anxiety. It's just honest. Very anxious people these days. A lot of anxiety, panic. So what we do is we... Anxiety makes a lot of noise, right? A lot of disturbance. So we go into the buzz of busyness to match it, to drown it out. Because getting quiet gets deafening. It's painful. Because when you get quiet or slow down or pause, then you start hearing the brokenness. Then you start feeling the things that haven't been, you know, tended to. And people say, hey, it's even a saying to, hey, got to stay busy, right? Got to stay busy. And for many, please understand, for many, even in my obsessive compulsive coaching work, I have to encourage them, get your eyes off of staring at yourself introspectively, because that's not what this is about. And look up and let love flow out of your life and practice loving, right? But it is a flow of learning to receive God's love and flow out in relationship. So what I'm encouraging is get in the flow of love and stop ignoring yourself and ignoring the brokenness of your life. And two, when we serve, let it be meaningful. Let it be a different pace because God is calling us to love our neighbor. And we have gotten lost in just loving everyone that we can find. See, loving your neighbor is a little bit more challenging because neighbors can be frustrating. <laughs> neighbors can be a little difficult. I even coach people who come to me and say, I'm having trouble with my neighbor. What do I do? <laughs> of the one that's in need right around you, and we get lost in all these other things that we should just keep doing, keep doing, keep doing. So meanwhile, we're ignoring our broken hearts, our insecurity, our self-hatred, our shame. Shame fuels constant, chronic, busy living and doing. Shame. Because shame says you're not loved as you are. You're going to have to do something. Many people, in myself included, you feel disconnected from God or you feel some kind of sinfulness over something in your life. Rejection enters. And what does rejection tells you? tell you? Oh, there's the separation between you and God. You got to fix this. And we then get into more busy serving to try to give an antidote. But it doesn't. We're still empty. And for many of us, we're realizing that serving can feed a false identity, our mask. And many of you are performers. The serving uh, feeds the performer in you, and people relate to the mask that you present. It hits that dopamine rush that we get out of feeling great. And, you know, you're such a great server. You have such a great servant's heart. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, meanwhile, do we really know each other? Do we know how to pause? Are we actually connecting to life in God and how we relate to each other? And many recognize that when you're not in a serving position, 
guilt increases. And what I propose to you is a lot of what we do is driven out of guilt. We do it out of the message of, I feel bad. And Christians often equate guilt with the work of the Holy Spirit. The harder the guilt, the better. Oh, really hit me hard. We become conditioned to a self-beating kind of compass in how we listen to God. But it keeps us in a performance-driven, never-ending, never-enough, and it leads us away from the rest of God and into a striving recipe for burnout. Let me remind you with a passage of Scripture that I think is important for us to be reminded of in this journey, and that is uh, found in, let me fix this here, in Luke's Gospel, in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now, what would you do if Jesus came to visit to your house? Many of us would be Martha's. We'd be, probably be nervous the whole time, right? She had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted. Do you hear the word? Do you hear the word? Distracted. Martha was distracted. Attention, Kmart shoppers. How many of you are distracted? Please come here over to aisle 77 for Distracted Compulsive Serving Detox. Thank you. Martha was distracted with much serving. Martha was distracted with much serving. In today's culture, we'd go, Martha, you're so wonderful. In today's culture, she'd go, Martha, you're so awesome. Just keep staying busy over there. Yeah, yeah, don't even bother. Just keep going. Keep going. Oh, this is so good. So good. Uh oh, right. <laughs> now she's distracted. Now, does this mean serving's bad? You know, this is where you, we always, you know, you have to be aware of how people go black and white from one extreme to another. No. It's, but distraction is getting in the way here. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care? So distraction and what many of us in obsessive compulsive serving do is we, we lose what's valuable. We lose sight of what's valuable. So our value, we made a value exchange. We're going to serve the machine of growth. But now we're not having effective, meaningful relationship connection, because this is taken over. And we get angry, we get upset that other people aren't in that mode. People at high performance, perfectionists, obsessors, they get irritated. The other people are not spinning at their RPMs. And she, Lord, you don't care? So now, she can't, now she's distorted in what she sees. She sees that Jesus doesn't care, because there's a value clash here. But Jesus is making value for real relationship connection. Martha is lost in a form of connection because chronic serving gives us an illusion of connection when it's actually not really happening. Now, serving can lead to connection. One of the classic examples is serving a table. You, of course, somebody's got to cook. But eventually, we got to sit down. And we got to be willing to just break bread and share because that part's actually scary for performers because in that mode, they're more vulnerable, right? If I ever want to get a performer, I got to get them out of their zone, get them outside of it and just see how to relate to them because then they start squirming in that kind of setting because it's, it's nerve wracking to be outside of the go-go serving mode. So she interprets it. Jesus doesn't even care. Therefore, tell her to help me. Right? She's getting irritated. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Now, I like to take this passage of Scripture and go a little bit deeper than where it's mostly taught. It's mostly taught 
the, the, the story here is we need to make more time to spend time with Jesus. And I think that we're only getting a portion, of course, spending time with Jesus, connecting in our prayer and devotion to him, of course, absolutely. But this is actually bringing about, don't lose sight of relationship interaction at the mercy of chronic serving and busyness. I believe that's really what the heart is here because Mary is connecting, truly connecting with Christ as he walks this earth and he is there at her, at her, um, at Martha's home. She's like, I want to utilize this as a way to connect. And I think for many of us, we need to give back to the heart of those you interact with, of seeing this exhortation of I need to make room for meaningful interaction because then that helps my interaction with God and my interaction with God helps me to have meaningful interaction and my meaningful interaction helps me have, right? We learn the love of God, how we relate to each other and how we relate to each other flows out of how we relate to God, how we relate to ourselves. And so I pray that for many of you today, you will take the exhortation and begin to realize, okay, am I, am I serving this kind of system in my life and in my journey? And do I need to pause and go, whoo, where do I need to get grounded in this? I'll take a moment to address a question that came in because it, um, it reveals where this can get very obsessive compulsive in the sense of chronic serving and having to do things. I will um, pull this up here. I have a question about helping people obsessively. Recent I've, recently, I've had a struggle where I go out into town, I see a homeless person asking for help, and I get this overwhelming urge to go out and give money to them. So see, this, the description shows the obsessive compulsive. Now, what I'm going to share with you is an intense example, but many of you are somewhere in the spectrum where you can relate to this to some extent. You may not have it at this exact level, or maybe you have it even more intensely. This overwhelming urge, there's the guilt, there's the disturbance of instead of doing something out of compassion, which because of our lack of being nurtured in love and being equipped in love, we confuse love with guilt. We confuse love with being, I, I, I got to do something about this disturbance I feel. I, um, so you get this overwhelming urge to go out and give money to them. Even if I don't have money, I feel the urge to go to the bank and withdraw money to give to them. I recognize that there is a lot of fear around this subject, so I try to use what I've learned in the past by re redirecting to rest in God's love and praying for discernment from the Holy Spirit, and at times trying to drive past them to continue on with my day in starving compulsion. You know what I find a lot in these situations is people that feed that. They are actually neglecting their neighbor or, or those around them, and they feed the compulsive need to 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 serve these other situations because driving by someone who, um, uh, you, you know, uh, what they, what they see a homeless person, driving by a homeless person, you don't know them. So serving them, listen to me, serving them is easier because you don't know them. It's harder to find a way to love your friend or your spouse when you're having struggles or someone you're in proximity to. That's harder work. So to serve them in that way and serving your family doesn't get a lot of accolades. Giving to a homeless person could give you an Instagram picture and can get you something that you can, um, you can shout it out to others and show, you know, hashtag serving, <laughs> right? I'm just being honest here. You, you work in a large church. You serve all these people. You don't know many of them. They don't know you. That's easier. Mm, now I'm getting into the weeds. Jerry Seinfeld makes a great joke. He talks about his relational awkwardness. And he says to the audience, he says, I am comfortable talking to all of you, but I'm completely uncomfortable talking to any of you. <laughs> it's such a great statement because that speaks to so many of us. It is easy to serve people we don't know. And I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying it's, it's honest assessment. We, it's harder to love those people near you because they're, they're strongholds and sins and goofiness bumps up against you. 
and challenges you in your journey. So oh, let's avoid that. That's why many times many people avoided their marriage, but they more they sure involved in ministry. Oh, what a servant's heart. You know, we applaud it, right? And we we got lost in priority. So anyway, I'll get back to I'll get back to the question here. In trying to starve this compulsion, however, I feel a tremendous amount of guilt. Many of us are in a journey of detoxing our relationship with toxic guilt and serving that because guilt is the message of I feel bad. And secondly, guilt is not about others. It's about you. It's about alleviating something you feel versus out of love, making it about somebody else. You notice the difference there? So we're doing things just to make ourselves feel better. And God would, uh, so she says, as I see him, I pray God would help them and my brothers and sisters on the street in this season to clothe, feed, and nourish them. But I'm constantly reminded of how James 2.15 describes a brother or sister lacking food and clothing. See, there's a difference. A brother or sister. Someone close to you, you see, has a need and you have the ability to help them. That's what James is talking about. The homeless person down the street, you don't know that person. I'm not saying don't give to a homeless person you don't know. <laughs> if, if, you're, if that's what you're getting, you're missing the heart of what I'm saying. And, and James 2, 7, 15 to 17 describes a brother or sister lacking food and clothing and the person who could help, saying to the brother or sister to be fed and clothed but not helping that their faith has no profit. Exactly. That a brother or sister, this is now, we're talking about proximity. This is talking about neighbor. This is talking about um, someone you have the ability to help. And it's right there, and you say no. You say, oh, 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 it works out. I've actually had this happen in my life. I've been in great need, and share it, and people go, oh, I hope it works out. You know, no judgment against them, but it's like, I'm, he's talking about an issue of someone has the ability to help, and again, it's someone who is close to you. This is brother or sister level. And you're not stepping up and helping. So you can see where this gets distorted for the person writing this question. This caused a great deal of fear in starving my compulsions by driving by and not helping. So your assignment is going to be drive by and don't help and find ways to be a blessing to those around you because this, um, will, this will lead to compulsive behavior over and over and over again. I think I might be one of the first pastors online to say um, I, your assignment is to not help that person. <laughs> ah, I usually pray that God would give me discernment about what he would have me to do, but I'm always directed to scriptures like 1 John 3, 17, which says, help those who have earthly possession and sees his brother in need. Again, brother, brother. We need to recognize opportunity to brother, right? Now, there's a story of the um, um, where Jesus talked, when they said, who's my neighbor? And Jesus talked about you walking by. What was the common thread when people who walked by the person that was in need? They were busy. They were busy serving. <laughs> they were busy doing their jobs. I don't got time for this. They were in their chronic church serving and didn't recognize, hey, I got to pause for someone that, that truly has need here, Right? So, but this person is bringing out the guilt and compulsive perspective that doesn't allow the scriptures to, to, to be put in perspective. And how does the love of God dwell? Okay, but, and, and, oh, and the judgment revelation where Jesus casts out the goat saying, I was naked and you did not close me. I was hungry, you did not feed me. And talking about helping others. This also causes a great deal of guilt and confusion within me because I want to help my brothers and sisters on the street. And I'm grateful that God has blessed me with so much but I'm driven by guilt and fear to do so. Yeah, and that's this, I'm in the business of helping people to shift from living a fear and guilt-based lifestyle into a love, rest, flow with walking by the Holy Spirit. And that's going to be learning the new language of the fruit of the Spirit versus being driven by all the toxic stuff that we feel compelled to listen to. And it makes us very compulsive in how we relate to people. I recognize that God has not given us, me a spirit of fear. Perfect love casts out fear, and I'm still learning and growing, but I have trouble reconciling this fear and the scriptures. How would one go about this situation? And I, I think that one of the things is learning how to differentiate between compassion versus guilt. Compassion lets you look outward in a flow of God's love for them, 
and it leads to helpful things. Um, there are times where you go, hmm, I, I think I did that out of guilt. It's all right. You're practicing and you're learning. Guilt is all about, I feel bad. It's about you alleviating those bad feelings. So now we're losing, losing sight. There's a great exhortation in 2 Corinthians 9, in verse 7, the NIV gives an interesting translation where it talks about uh, don't give out of, out of compulsion. Give as you have decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. And one with OCD is going, oh, I, I should pray, I don't know, the sheep and the goats, and you're actually being commanded, don't give that way. How many of us, even in offerings, you know, you're, oh, I better give or else God's going to curse me. Get the thing about, don't give to the, just disturbance. He says, don't do that for God loves a cheerful giver. You ever, all of us have had the moment where you just cheerfully gave and it was just a blessing to do that. You have those. We have to remember those moments because then we equate these disturbance moments. Compassion is about Helping your brother, sister, your neighbor out of that place of just love, not disturbance. Guilt is all about disturbance, and it finds ways to create disturbance. That just right, never enough comes in. And it's like, oh, what about people in other countries? What about starving people in other countries? Look at you and all you, right? It becomes an accusatory thing. And so many people give, serve, do out of guilt. This is kind of a different tangent, but I remember speaking of offerings, I re, I, I've told this story before, but I remember as a youth pastor, I was in a, um, a large service gathering where they're trying to raise funds for missions, and they just kept pouring it on and pouring it on and pouring it on. And it was very clear they're just using constant guilt manipulative tactics. And even the teenagers in uh, our youth group were like, oh, this, is, this is getting to be a bit much. I looked over, and one of our teens down the aisle, as the bucket was being passed, she's crying. And it wasn't a good cry. And I was like, what's going on? And she had taken some money that was for her and for her family, and she had felt disturbed, and she felt she had to give it all and put it in the bucket. And um, I, I did something that, I don't know, maybe, maybe other people wouldn't do this. I went back and grabbed the offering bucket, and I took the money. I go, is this it right here? Yeah, okay. Well, all right. no, don't want any funny business. I gave her money back. You're not giving. Move on. Because <laughs> I'm just a guilt fighter. A guilt fighter. Not gonna and um, not being manipulative can sometimes you feel like it costs you because you you let you train people to give out of love because manipulation can can get people to move in your favor. And when you get out of that and you don't manipulate people, um, it can sometimes feel like you pay a price for that because you, you actually want freedom. You want people to be free, but it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. So many of you, uh, I believe, are going to be blessed by this broadcast. If you were, would you click the like button? Like, the like bucket. The like button. The light like button. There we go. Click subscribe. Go to markdehesus.com where you can get more newsletter information from me that I love to send out on a weekly basis. And if this blessed your life and your journey, would you consider a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter? Be sure to get a copy of the OCD Healing Journey, which tags along wonderfully, if you have that battleground, but it tags along wonderfully to my book, The Heart Healing Journey that will help encourage a journey of awakening, healing, and transforming your life. Of course, I mentioned performance-driven living. You can get a copy of Exposing the Rejection Mindset will help you get to the root of what creates that sense of separation and disconnect. Again, it's a wonderful honor to be your brother from another mother, providing insights for your healing and freedom journey. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. I'll be back with some more good stuff. In the meantime, I'm out. <laughs>